say just a teeny bit about the genesis of this. I think we have all been hearing a lot um, about development and development concepts, many of which we have all been uh, thinking about for a long time, working on in our individual capacities, whether it's sustainability, country ownership, uh, partnering, capacity development. These are all words that have been close to our hearts for a very long time, things that we have been working on and doing. And we can see that in today's environment, it's really important to spread the understanding of where we have been and where we have come and what our starting point is, and that we don't reinvent a wheel, but that we keep moving forward, building off the base of the past. For SID, for our professionals, as development professionals, we have a lot of accumulated expertise to bring to that discussion. And today's session, part of our special series on the future of foreign aid under the Obama administration is part of that effort. Um, and so what we will be doing is we've got a couple of panelists. Uh, many of you already know all of these people because they are stars, and that's Asif Sheikh and Paul O'Brien. And they are going to talk, and uh, we have discussed that they will talk about um, uh, what these terms have been for them over time in projects and get it down from platitudes to actual country examples. Um, and I can say that Asif and Paul are very lively, very interesting people, and we will see what they bring to you. Whether they follow what we have talked about or they invent something new, either way, it will be highly entertaining. Um, then also as discussants, um, we have Stacy Young and Richard Blue. And uh, Stacy is going to um, give us comments on, uh, from the perspective of knowledge management, and Richard Blue from the perspective of monitoring and evaluation. It's always great to be back at a SID event. This is truly the global town square. Uh, I want to say a brief word if I can have a minute extra, Betsy, about Andy Rice. Oh. Uh, everyone knows that Andy co-founded Sid uh, 53 years ago. He is gravely ill and has very little time left. Uh, he created a profession. He established bonds that span the globe. And he has built the global town square where we can all come. And uh, he's much loved. So I just want to recognize the great soul. OK, the topic for this session is aid effectiveness, an engine for strategic change. Betsy, no. I really do not want to give this presentation. And so I may as well start out by telling you why. Um, aid effectiveness is a hugely important issue. But my mind is simply in a different space right now. What preoccupies me is development success rather than aid effectiveness per se. And there is a difference, and we have a long way to go on development success. So being contrary, I decided to title my remarks, Aid Effectiveness Strain from the Script. <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> uh, I want to open with what I see as the core context, and then touch on three topics very briefly. <coughs> Uh, ground truthing, learning, and then straying from the script. Uh, as I move through these points, I'll stray farther and farther from the script of aid effectiveness. And if there's one thread that runs through everything I have to do, say, or want to say, it has something to do with humility. Um, so let me start with the context and get directly to the point. There are a lot of interests at stake in trying to establish that aid has been effective. Let's be blunt. And the result of that, because there is far too much bashing in this town, I've been around long enough to see contractor bashing, NGO bashing, <coughs> donor bashing, bashing of post governments. Frankly, I don't think any of it is <coughs> 
but the result is that the definitions of aid effectiveness tend to get very narrow. And when they do that, we sort of already know the answer. Right? It's the answer for anything generic that's narrowly defined. Some aid has been very effective in achieving the objectives that it set out to achieve. Some has been less. And some has been outright on that. I assume everyone knows the term. Waste of money, brains, and time. Well, the differences between these categories merits close attention. It's really important. I don't want to diminish it. We are spending billions of dollars, and we must make that money work to make the differences that we need. But I don't want to make the case about what has and hasn't worked. What I want to focus on is the sad, hard truth that we are 60 years into development, and 3.18 billion people, half the world's population, live on two and a half dollars a day or less. And the average is $1.60. And inequality between countries and within countries is sore. And the ability of the poor to see inequality is also sore. We're trying to get the volume right. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm for it. Um, <laughs> uh, the ability to see that inequality is also sore because of modern technology. So for me, the takeaway contextual message is this. I am prepared to argue strongly that there are a large number of quality implementers across all segments of our community who are consistently effective, consist consistently above average, and unfailingly committed. But 60 years into development, we are at the intersection of the three Ds. And there's a reason for it. And so we can't just pat ourselves on the back and say we're on track. That's what I want to talk about. <coughs> ground truth. Betsy asked me to address two ground level examples from IRG's experience. There are 100 people in this room who could talk about their own experiences. <coughs> I'll focus on two things that I know personally. I want to be contrarian, however, because that's my job. Uh, most quality implementers complain that they've had major impact here or there. They work with the people, local ownership, compiled best practices, and all of that. But I want to make the counterpoint as well. I will cite but not dwell on two examples because there's not enough time to get into very much detail that have built success uh, over decades in countries where success seemed quite improbable and in countries that are themselves not successful. Niger and Pakistan. I'll be very brief touching on each. Okay, Niger. I was a United Nations volunteer in Niger. Uh, when I began my 30, 30 years of experience, 37 years ago. Um, and I've cared about that country ever since. It is one of the poorest countries in the world, semi-desert, and the poster child for deforestation and degradation. So we have uh, and desertification, like declining agricultural yields, livestock production, growing food insecurity, and spreading poverty. Yet in the last decade, witnessed, and we have documented an enormous change, this tremendous green revolution, not of the type that happened in Asia, but in terms of reforestation in Niger. Five million hectares have been reforested in the heart of the most populated region of the country. 200 million trees planted. There's improved agricultural productivity and water conservation enormously reduced burdens on women and children who bear the brunt of firewood collection and water collection. Greater potential for food security. So two takeaways from that. First, there was lots of outside assistance. It happened in pockets, leopard spots, bits and pieces over time. Momentum built slowly and gained, uh, gained force over decades. But two, this was not a project success. It was a development success. And that success belongs solely and completely to the people of Niger. As their options diminished and they saw the benefits that early adopters, with some foreign assistance, had gained, self-adoption 
took it to scale. But aid was key to critical points. And in the end, aid was effective because credit has been back at scale. And this, despite the fact that Niger as a country is not a star performer. But certain key policy exceptions led to wider reforms in a certain sector. Experiments, successes, failures, a lot of risk taking that allowed the right enabling conditions in that sector for people to take the initiative in their own self-interest. Aid helped the people of Niger make the success. Pakistan. I wasn't a volunteer in Pakistan, but I'm originally from Pakistan. It's one of the world's poorest, most volatile countries, one of the most populous, one of the most geopolitically important, one of the most unstable. Its electricity sector, a whole different part of the development uh, has been cited forever as the poster child for inefficiency and corruption. In the 1980s, Pakistan realized that it needs 3,000 megawatts electricity to meet the needs of its own population. And there was no way in um, hell, let's all look at the camera as I say that, um, <laughs> that the government of Pakistan could possibly raise the capital to meet those requirements. Is this better? Okay. Um, hence, uh, USAID and the government of Pakistan determined that there was a need for private investment, to bring in private investment, and hence, private sector power project that Iron Sheen was involved in managing. And yet, if you think about it, if you're a foreign investor, what is going to cause you to invest a billion dollars or more in a fixed asset that you can't pick up and take with you in a country unless you have an entire investment regime that allows you to feel secure about making so from the electricity sector need emerged much broader need for transformation of the entire political uh, policy framework of the country. And cutting a long story short, the result has been that from the 80s and the 90s onward, a series of institutions were built that created an entire framework, the private power and infrastructure board, the investment board, a regulatory framework, a whole series of policy reforms. And even today, 15 or 20 years later, these organizations, and I just came back from Pakistan, these organizations are actually very strong. They have very committed and dedicated leaders. And surprisingly, ironically, for a country like Pakistan, it has one of the best potential policy environments on which to bring in private investment and transform the electricity. But here's the counterpoint. Major electricity problems still loom in Pakistan. The sector is still corrupt and inefficient. And its <clears throat> financial needs threaten to bring down the entire economy of Pakistan. So we have this contradiction, yet the reforms set in motion decades ago may have laid the groundwork for future success. And the challenge now is to turn a project success into a development success. Take away lesson, aid effectiveness and development success don't always coincide. Success, even sustainability, is fragile. Aid was effective, but there is a larger development problem that has remained unaddressed. Second point, learning. Okay, most people in this room know the lessons learned. And there are certain people in this room who will be talking about them. I know Paul will talk about them. I've heard him before. Uh, he's extremely articulate on them. I know Stacy will discuss how to turn lessons into useful knowledge. I've heard her before, and I know I agree with both of them, so I'm not going to repeat what they want to say. So let me instead say what I want to say. The point I want to make about learning is this. The challenge is to learn from what we didn't do. Not just to learn about the effectiveness of what we did do. And not just to compile a record of what was successful. The 
challenge is not to lose sight of the fact that the only reason we care about aid effectiveness is for development success. What about the 3.18 billion who live in poverty? What is it that we did not do, and what did we do? <coughs> okay. Now for the part that I came for, which is strength in the script. This is what I really came to say. We can tinker at the edges. We don't do development. Only the people can make development happen. The necessary condition, unpleasant as it may sound, is that government must function. We delude ourselves if we think we can just go around government. This is a huge dilemma, I know, because most governments in developing countries are corrupt, dysfunctional, inefficient. But government must work. And there are some minimum conditions. And uh, Secretary Summers cited them not long ago. If we think that economic growth alone can lift large numbers of people out of poverty, we're wrong. But if we think we can lift large numbers of poverty uh, of people out of poverty without sustained economic growth, we're not just wrong, we're delusional. So we need to achieve economic growth in a sustained way, but in a way that also reduces poverty. And that's where the intersection of aid and development have to work. Uh, there is no example that I know in history, and if there is, it's the exception that proves the rule of sustained economic growth without three conditions. Reasonably stable, moderately benign, and a reasonable, reasonably predictable government that allows people to take initiative. <coughs> the only examples of sustainable poverty reduction at scale have been where countries function reasonably well. The reason is that poor people are smart. Half to three quarters of the problem is solved if they can have a framework of good governance where they can take initiative. So let me leave you with this closing thought in one minute. <coughs> Development is changing. We need to update our definitions. Think about it. All of us in this room have known development in a variety of ways. 30 years ago, 70% of the capital flows from the U.S. to developing countries were from the public sector. Today, 80% are private. What does that mean? What does that mean about development, how countries enter the community of nations? What is the role of the diaspora communities, where the capital flows are huge, and the incomes of those communities and their impact on their home societies is huge and I think really untapped in development work? Uh, what is the role of infrastructure? It's receiving new attention that it has long deserved, and it is having major, major impact. What is the role of technology? cell phones that empower farmers in ways that have never happened before. What is the role of globalization? Whether you're for it or against it, you cannot stop it. There have been negative effects and demonstrations about it, but I would argue and would look forward to discussing that there have been huge positive effects of globalization as well. And our challenge, because we can stop it, is to channel it in ways that are constructive and to help bring about development at scale. So the only way we're going to get from here to there is for countries to leverage the real new drivers of development. And this requires, this is a key point, building local and national capacity. The intersection of secure, stable, and functional states needs much more attention than we need in the development process. We need to think of aid as more than just helping the poor that's the best and noblest of what we do, and we must do it in times of need, we will always do it. But we also have to think of aid as helping states become functional. And I know this is a complex process, but we cannot succeed at scale simply by going around dysfunctional governments. That's a really tough challenge, but that is the challenge, and that's the challenge. Thank you, Asif. Well, I'm actually thrilled that Asif uh, decided to take a little bit of a left turn. Uh, I'm sort of going to 
tear up a little bit of what I was going to say and try and uh, follow on what he said, because I actually agree. And I wonder if, if many of us in this room disagree. I had a little look at uh, who was here, and, and I know many familiar faces. There's a, probably a lot more knowledge in this room. I, I'm not sure I'll tell you anything that's new. But so let's maybe have a little bit of a provocative discussion about the proposition and uh, see if we can challenge ourselves. Um, so I obviously had a, a, a daft job for the last three years if I was working on aid effectiveness. That's not the issue. It's about development effectiveness. It's about development success, right? So uh, let's start there. Um, and if, as Asif says, development success is not actually about what we do, but about what they do, and ultimately it's about moderately benign and stable states, then okay, let's start there. What are we going to do with that equation? And how can, what I'm going to try and do is tie that challenge back to the discussion we're having in Washington right now. And I deeply believe that if we, the people in this room, do not have a very serious discussion around these issues over the next year, particularly the next few months, um, we will end up with a vector, with a direction um, that is going to take us down a road for a long period of time that we may, we may like in part, but we may be deeply worried about. So I'm urging all of you to take up a challenge yourselves. If you think this is a meaningful discussion, what does this mean for me, and how can I push it forward in a way that I believe in? Okay, that's the big picture. Um, let me just try and first contextualize why I think what Asif is saying is, um, is, is, is deeply challenging and is as you take it from platitudes to something more concrete, um, is, is not a discussion that will resolve itself easily in Washington. Um, if we believe that we don't have the resources to lift people out of poverty, if we believe that every single success story, development success story, has been more about what they were capable of doing than what we were capable of doing, then it is all about ownership. And that word, frankly, has a lot of currency now. Everybody's using it. Nobody says ownership doesn't matter anymore. But it's one of those words that basically risks being nothing more than a platitude. And it means different things to different people. We're starting from a premise that we're engaging in countries who have demonstrated a failure to own their own development process in one way or another. And there are some people who, whether they say it or not, say, if the one thing we know about the countries in which we're investing is that they haven't been able to own their development process thus far, why do we want to give them more ownership? And that plays out in various ways. There are people who say, oh, it's great to talk about it, but if you mean handing over our American tax donors to unaccountable and corrupt governments, how are we ever going to be able to sustain this broader effort? And if ownership is fundamentally about power, that's what it really is. I mean, that is one of the key elements about uh, in, in the idea of letting somebody own their own journey forward. It's about a transfer of power. And if we have development agencies in the United States that are feeling a distinct lack of their own power right now, and feeling that the power that they do have has been fragmented into so many different areas, how do you turn around to a USAID professional who feels they haven't been given enough power and say, you know that, that, that last vestige of authority you have to decide on development directions with the 50 other agencies that are working in this town? We want you to give that away in the name of ownership to the people that you're supposed to be serving. So yes, we believe in it. Yes, everybody in this room has heard the term before. And yes, I, I bet all of us could make a decent argument on why it's effective, but on why it's essential to effectiveness. But how do we actually translate it into something that meaningfully contributes to the challenge that ASIF gave us? Um, that's something we've been struggling at at Oxfam for a while. I do. Uh, I think many of you have probably had our, our ideas about ownership foisted on you. I'm going to share just a very brief skeletal outline and then get to what I think is the interesting debate in Washington. We at Oxfam believe that if you want to take that the the potential platitude of ownership into something concrete, you have to ask three things. What are you actually trying to transfer? One, you have to transfer information. You have to tell people what you're doing in their countries in ways that they can use and a government that is trying to live up to the standard that ASIF is talking about can manage that information and plan for the future and build that compact with their own citizenry and say, this is what we want to do with those uh, eight dollars. If we don't give them information 
that is both transparent and predictable, they can't make that pact with their citizens. And it's very hard for us to do that when our system looks like spaghetti. And it's very hard to do that when our appropriation system won't let you make promises beyond one year. So if we care about transferring ownership in the vein of information, we're going to have to address those challenges. The MCC tries to do that by making five-year commitments and doing it in a way that is very transparent on their websites. I think they're positioned better than many other agencies because of that to say they're trying to put governments in the lead. But USAID tries to do it through SOACs, but are those SOACs being respected anymore? Um, it's a big question. I talked to some USAID professionals last night who said, you know, yes, it's the right idea, but the, they're often not worth the paper they're written on anymore in terms of us being able to bank on those commitments. That's the first challenge. Are we able to tell governments, people, what we're doing in their countries? Second challenge, the, 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 the one we all struggle with, capacity. Are we actually able to transfer the power to manage your own development into their hands? And you know, I mean, I, many of us have worked overseas um, with uh, quote unquote counterparts who said even that notion itself is fraught with problems because it assumes we start with no capacity ourselves. But there is something meaningful in the challenge. How do we, we know that a government that wants to live up to assets challenge needs to be able to do a couple of things, no more than a couple of things, but uh, some very clearly understood things very well if we are going to increasingly um, allow ourselves to let them manage their own development. They need to be able to manage their own finances, be able to report to their own people, so on and so forth. We know we have, we're working in contexts where they haven't demonstrated that capacity in the past. We want to transfer it to them. President Obama, when the first time practically he spoke as president about this, said we haven't got the answer to this question last June. He said, we're spending way too much money talking about capacity, and we're not there. There's a, there, uh, the bashing that goes on around the contracting, the bashing that goes on around the NGOs. We are not there in answering this question, but we know what we have to do, which is we've got to find a way to incentivize genuine capacity transfer as the real measure of success. The, the consulting firm or the NGO that is able to say, I didn't just check off boxes, I didn't just fill out an RFA, I didn't just do whatever the, the, the overpressed USAID officer asked me to do. I can actually tell you a story about people who don't need me anymore and who are running those functions without my help. And that's why I am making more money if I'm a for-profit agency or a more effective NGO uh, if I'm in the non-profit game. The paradigm shift of what success looks like in capacity has to change. We know that Clinton is put, uh, sorry, Secretary Clinton is, is, is challenging uh, both the for-profit and non-profit community to do that. We know the president is, has challenged us to do that. I don't think we've yet got very clear answers on how it's going to happen, but I think a lot of those answers are going to have to come from us. And I'll get back to you on why. And then finally, and probably the one that's most fraught with tension, are we really willing to give away the power and hand over the control of the development agenda to those governments? who say to us, if you really want the kind of leadership that Asif is talking about, the only way to really learn is to do. Let us be in charge of our development agenda. Let us declare the priorities. If we say it's infrastructure, give us infrastructure money. Are we actually willing to hand over control of the development agenda to the, to, to the people who we know are fundamental to its success? That is fraught with issues when you've got challenges in Washington in terms of Congress who believes the best way to protect the effectiveness of our aid is through earmarks. It's fraught with the fact, and this takes me to the real thing I want to talk to you about, the stories I want to tell you about from the field, with the fact that you've got different people at the table whose views of ownership mean that they come to the question of control with very different measures of success. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what that means in Afghanistan, and a little bit if I have time on Haiti, and you can tell me if I have time. So, if you buy basically what we've been saying, which is it's not about us, it's about them, that's ultimately about ownership, that if you really want to think about things like sustainability and scale, you think about it in terms of countries, and that means governments and their citizens' ability to hold those governments accountable. How does a development professional think about that? How does a defense professional think about that? And how does a diplomatic professional think about that? Because that's the debate that's going on over the next year. Everybody's talking about ownership, but they mean different things. So here's how it plays out in Afghanistan. A lot of the, I've seen, I think many of you have seen or read or heard about the new Afghanistan-Pakistan plan. There's going to be a lot more money for Afghan ownership. 
Some of it's going to go into cattle, and that will be run largely by civilians, and it will go into ministries where we do the kinds of things that I used to do, where technical advisors support others. But a huge proportion of it is going out into the areas where the least development has happened and where the stakes are highest, which is the rural areas. Now, here's how that plays out. There's a Humvee, because you have to move around in a Humvee in Afghanistan. And the person in charge of the provincial reconstruction team, there's lots of these all over Afghanistan now, the person in charge of that, who has been in charge of that since they were created in 2004, is a military commander. He's in the driver's seat, normally he. Sitting next to him, because we've now had this big innovation, is somebody from the Department of State. A foreign service officer is now in the passenger seat. They are the co-leads of the PRT. In the back seat, they're allowed in the car, is the USAID professional who's part of the PRT but takes their orders from the Department of State in the passenger seat and the military commander who's really running the show because they're driving. Beside them is a National Guard reservist who's there to provide agricultural expertise, also in the back seat. Now the four of them drive into a little village and they've all been talking about ownership when they walk in, when they're, when they're driving. They come into the village and they're doing agricultural work because that's part of the mandate. How does the conversation go? Well, the USAID professional who's been a, basically fighting poverty for 15, 20 years wants to go find where the poor people are and have a conversation about what they need. So it goes and fights farmers and says, what do you need? Well, we've got this program. We think, uh, you know, if, if you can help us with pest uh, control or some extension work or we can think about a better crop rotation um, with some, some long-term assets over the next five years, we can increase our agricultural productivity by 15, 20% and that will help us to stay off the poppy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, that sounds like a great idea and let me talk to you about the kinds of resources we have and you know how those conversations go. So they've got their plans where hopefully they've been listening to the farmers, that conversation's great, and they come back to the PR, to, to the, uh, the Humvee where this is the problem, where the commander who runs the PRT and the FSO officer, who's probably an incredibly thoughtful, well-informed, well-prepared person to be in Afghanistan, has been given the mission, what is in the United States' immediate interests? That's their job. So they went and talked to the most powerful person they could find in the village, and they said, what do you need with agriculture money? And the local chief said, what I need is a big cold storage thing right beside my farm. Because if I have that cold storage thing, all these farmers, which you need to keep under control so that they don't join the Taliban, are gonna need me. You need me, powerful. Give me the cold storage. You've got a pile of money and it's either gonna to go to long-term agricultural development work or it's gonna to go to that nice big cold storage and the empowerment of the local chief. <laughs> That is the 3D debate that's going on in Afghanistan right now. And I can tell you when the conversation happens in the Humvee, when they're on their way driving back to wherever their base is, it's very hard if you're in a Humvee to hear anything that's going on in the back seats. <laughs> and that's going to be the debate that we continue to have over the next year as we try to tell the world we get what Asif is, is talking about. We get the fact that we can't develop all these countries. They have to develop themselves, and we care deeply about development. So that is my big concern. I watch this thing evolve as it goes into Haiti. There are some really thoughtful people in the State Department trying to make sure that we make the right decisions in Haiti, and they're talking about putting the Haitians in charge, but they are, again, diplomats, and they're asking questions from a diplomatic perspective. What's the measure of success? How can we get success in Haiti in a year? How can we make sure that the American people view Haiti as a success politically because we need it? And the aid professionals who are going in there are increasingly being asked to serve that agenda, not the agenda of what are we going to do to get Haiti to meet ASIF's test 10 years from now. So I feel like I've talked a lot. I had a couple of other examples from Haiti. I'd happily take them in. in, in. Okay. So, well, just let me wrap up. Um, ownership, sustainability, effective states, none of those are in debate anymore. And we don't need to spend too much time at this high level. But many of them risk being platitudes. And unless we in the development community, who actually, for one reason or another, have made the commitment that we want the voices of those farmers in this discussion, and the women who are often 
not even there when it's if you, for me that's a personally important thing because I was in Afghanistan uh, for so long and it was so hard. How do we make sure that in the, the as every part of the government starts thinking from a di diplomatic perspective, from a defense perspective, and from a development perspective, that ownership and putting countries in charge and finding the winners is, is, is the key to what U.S. development ought to be about. How do we make sure those voices are involved? I think it's largely up to us, and so my call to all of you is keep the debate alive over the next six months and over the next year when you see the presidential uh, the outcome of the Presidential Study Directive that uh, President Obama will get from the National Security Council, when you see the outcome of the Quadrennial uh, Diplomacy and Development Review, which is coming out, George, in uh, a month, I think, the end of this month, um, I would urge you to, to give them a harsh scan with those questions in mind. Thank you. We are very uh, fortunate to have Richard Blue here with us today. Let me turn over the podium to him. Well, thank you for the introduction. I, I, I would add that, if, that um, when I left the Asia Foundation after leaving AID under a cloud in 1990, uh, I was fortunate to experience uh, six years with the Asia Foundation, which we were able to do with very little bit, bits of money, some of the things that you have been talking about. And uh, it, it was an experience that led me as a programmer first and then later as an evaluator to really begin to look at the way we do business as being in some ways far more important than the goals and aspirations and the ideals that we profess, whether they be empowerment or good governance or whatever. And you've touched on some of those. And since both of you were kind of contrarian, and since I'm a contrarian, I have to be a non-contrarian in order to be contrarian. <laughs> Uh, I've just come back from Cambodia uh, and Thailand, uh, but mostly Cambodia where I was doing an evaluation and a strategy development piece for the U.S. aid mission for civil society. And, and, so, and, Cam and so I'm going to be concrete and talk about Cambodia for a few minutes if you don't mind, and then maybe try to attract a couple of lessons out of that. Um, Cambodia is in some ways a success story. Uh, the poverty, the number of people below the poverty line has actually dropped over the last 10 years. They've had a robust rate of growth, uh, running 8 9% for uh, seven or eight years. Uh, they have diversified their economy. They have a large cut and sew industry as well as, uh, as, well as uh, now attracting over 2 million people a year to Angkor Wat, uh, which is generating a, a lot of money. Uh, they are about to reap the benefits of offshore oil exploration in 2012. Chevron will start producing uh, oil off the, off, off the coast of Cambodia. Uh, they've had two elections that have been considered reasonably free and fair, as benign in, in a way, as, as a government. Uh, they have expanded the uh, reach of government throughout the nation. When I first started going in 1993, there was no government. Uh, there were just armed bands competing for power. And that, kept up until 1997. Uh, they are not a democratic government. Uh, they are masters at the facade uh, of democracy. Uh, and Oxfam actually was there. I think maybe you were there, Paul. I don't know, that did the report. So when I first go out there uh, last month, uh, the first thing the mission hands me is the Oxfam reports, uh, not only the, on Cambodia, but also the more general one that you did on aid effectiveness. So, I'm also doing, leading a team to, to analyze the Paris Declaration uh, for uh, the U.S. government, which includes state, aid, MCC, HHS, DOL, you, <laughs> you name it. Say, this is the whole of government approach. It's a word that we use to describe the reality of the fragmentation that has occurred over the last 15 years. <laughs> and now we're giving it a nice name. Uh, whole of government, well, that makes a lot of sense, right? That's all we're doing. Um, so I wanted to share with you a couple of the uh, suggestions that I made to the mission at the end of my stay in Cambodia, because I think they kind of fit with some of the stuff that you're talking about. Remember, this is civil society. We have not run any money through the, government, the Cambodian government. Since 1997, there's been a legislative prescription against that. That changed a little bit a couple of years ago when the ambassador uh, then uh, convinced the U.S. government that maybe we ought to be talking to the government of Cambodia. Why don't we do that? Because uh, they are corrupt. 
They are inefficient. It's basically uh, something that you and Wong would have been proud of uh, if you looked at the way the patent infrastructure of uh, power works. They have effectively privatized their government uh, in a way that uh, we would call institutionalized corruption. But really, if you want to have medical services, you pay for a public health doctor to give you those medical services. If you want your child to get an education, you pay for the public teacher uh, who runs the private class, who gives you the real stuff, as opposed to the public class in which they just kind of sit through there and read stuff. Uh, if you, if you, if the government wants, if you're a businessman and you want to get a license to do business, the government is very likely to say, yeah, but build barracks for the first division up in the Thai border first, and then we will talk about uh, what kind of uh, enterprise and investment you can make in our country. Well, most American companies can't do that. And so what you have is an economy on the, on, the, on, the, on the market side that's basically run by the Chinese and the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Thais in the thing. We have very limited impact in, from the private sector side uh, because of the fact that you have a government that really operates in a very transactional way uh, to do business. You do something for my group and we'll do something for your group. At the same time, Cambodia is excellent at producing laws. They have some of the best anti-trafficking laws in, in, in Asia. They had just passed an anti-corruption bill. They debated it for extensively for nine hours and then passed it. Uh, <laughs> you know, much the chagrin of everybody in the NGO community and so forth. So you do have a, a record of, of, of success in some ways. Uh, they, I, I would say not a democratic, but a somewhat benign government that's willing to tolerate a certain level of dissent and a certain level of diversity and pluralism. A very strong NGO community that should be strong because all of us have been putting all of our money through the NGO community and not through the, through the government. Uh, so what do we do with all of this? My recommendations were develop a cross-cutting civil society strategy focused on strengthening interaction with government on good governance issues in all fields. The problems of human rights are not just the denial of due process, there's the denial of health care, the denial of education. There is no, there is no firm, secure title to land if you're a small farmer in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the uh, rice belt, or if you're up in the Cardamom Mountains or Craybong or those areas. Your land can be exploited, expropriated, taken over by richer, more powerful people, uh, and is done so every day. On the downside of Cambodia, the Gini coefficient is worsening every year. 2% of the population is moving from landed, quote, quote, to landless every year. Uh, it's a population that is growing fast demographically and is a population that is 70% under the age of 30. And you can imagine the wave of people coming into a workforce that is going to occur in this small country and they ain't all going to go into cut and sew factories. They're going to have to be somewhere else. They're going to cut a lot of more leaders. Build on continue to support the national, the human rights act, uh, organizations, but strengthen local outreach. And finally, strengthen the development of policy dialogue, relevant data, and analysis. Much, Cambodia is full of reports. You can go and get a report on practically anything you want. It's usually in English. And it's usually written for the World Bank or the ADB or USAID or DIFA or somebody else. That data has never been put together in a way that could be accessible and used not only by Cambodians at the national level, but at the provincial level and even at the commune level. And my final statement is, is that if there's any room for action, it is precisely at the local level where most of these people are and where, in fact, they are showing the kinds of signs now that suggests if they're going to be left out, if they're going to be expropriated, if they're going to be kicked off their land and put into the landless, they're going to fight back. And I would predict that if we don't, and the Cambodian government doesn't agree to a different economic model, there is going to be instability in Cambodia that will rival that of the Khmer Rouge period. Mm -hmm. I also have some lessons learned from being an evaluator, but I didn't get to them. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Let me turn it over to Stacy to give us a few comments on knowledge management. Thank you, Stacy. <coughs> Thank you, Betsy. Um, I wanted to talk about knowledge management and, and a little bit more broadly about learning. Uh, 
in a couple of layers, I guess. The first layer um, having to do with scale, and the second layer having to do with local ownership, both of which I think our other speakers have argued um, quite, uh, quite forcefully and effectively, are central to both aid effectiveness and development success. And thank you, Austin, for that distinction, which I think is, is really useful. Um, the issue of scale, I believe, uh, depends in large measure on how we use the learning that we're generating through the work that, that we're doing. And this is central to a lot of knowledge management efforts, not just the one that I lead at USAID, but others at USAID, at, at other donor and implementing organizations and, and elsewhere. And the idea here, I think, is that, um, uh, and Paul touched on this, we don't have the resources to achieve what needs to be achieved in the developing world. If anybody who has the illusion that donors can really make a big difference with the dollars that we have, well, it, it, it's, it's just that, it's an illusion, I think. Uh, our, our budgets sound large until you put them against the, the challenges facing us in the developing world. And when we look at, at that um, disparity between our resources and the need, then we begin to understand how important our learning is. Because the learning is what can be scaled when it is shared in ways that others can take that learning, adapt it to local conditions, refine it, and apply it. So I, I think that it's important to think about aid effectiveness in terms of how we make the best use of that resource, of what we learn as we move through our development initiatives, um, how well we capture that to share with others, how well we create opportunities for others to engage in that learning, um, and how well we uh, promote the application of that learning. So I, th I think that's critical to scale, and that's something that um, I, ha has attracted varying levels of attention in international development over the decades that we've been engaged in this. Knowledge management, an emphasis on learning, these are not new things, but the ways that we've done them have, have changed over time, and I think the amount of attention that we've given to, the, to those activities has changed over time. Uh, I think that we now are in a position where we have a lot more ability to capture and share what we've learned in ways that are, are easier to adapt and refine and apply. So I think we're, we're in a good position vis-a-vis -vis, you know, the capture and dissemination of, of lessons learned. Where we face greater challenges, and I think also you're absolutely right about this, is, is really digging in around what we don't know. And I think that local <coughs> ownership is critical to that part of the equation. Uh, and, and is really sort of the next horizon for this area of work that we call knowledge management or learning. And here I think what's required is a lot more attention to the process of implementation. This isn't what people usually think of when they think about knowledge management, but when I look at how we implement our projects, what I see very infrequently is a genuine learning culture. And I think that that learning culture has to be something that we focus on more and promote more. Because what we have now is a situation in which I think all too often we believe that we are the generators of knowledge. We believe that we are the ones who can create the answers for the developing world. That we then take those answers to developing countries and developing country partners and governments. And I have to, um, I know it's a polite call, but I've got to disagree with you a little bit with some of your formulations. Uh, because I don't think that it is up to us to make a decision about whether we turn over control of a development agenda to, to local partners, um, whether we transfer, transfer information that is, is useful to them. I think that if the, if the learning that we're generating does not put local knowledge at its center, then it's unlikely to really be effective in meeting the kinds of challenges that, that you and Asif have articulated. Um, and I, I think that that's why we're 60 years in, or one of the reasons that we're 60 years in, and we haven't seen uh, greater progress toward, uh, toward solving some of the key um, challenges in developing countries, that we too often nurture our own illusion that we are the ones who can create the learning, and we are the ones who know how to, how to create development. And, and what we need is, is first, I agree that, that stable uh, governments and, and um, 
economic stability, those are, those are critical enabling conditions. And I, I agree that uh, we need to understand better how to foster those enabling conditions. I don't think that we are there yet, and I don't think that we're going to get there unless we change the way that we do development, which means making it knowledge driven, but that, that goes so far beyond capturing what we consider to be lessons learned and sharing. That's a critical part of it, but, but much more central to making, uh, making development knowledge driven, I think, is asking the question, whose knowledge counts? Whose knowledge are we, are we leveraging in the way that we construct our, our development initiatives? Um, so I, I think that what that means really is, um, is continually challenging our development hypotheses and uh, creating incentives to do that. I, I think that uh, donors such as USAID are not very good at that. I think that we create situations in which our partners don't feel at all comfortable in, in challenging development hypotheses. I think that the whole way that project cycles are designed uh, work counter to that necessary activity. Um, saying that it's important to set at the outset your goal and where you're going to be three years hence, that's a good starting point, but it's too often taken as the end point. And so the development implementation becomes an issue of, as, as Asa said, project success. Have we achieved what we said three years ago we were going to set out to achieve? Not, have we uh, succeeded in altering our, our approach as local conditions change and as we learn more, such that our approach evolves uh, for the maximum benefit of our development objectives. I think that we create um, uh, implementation cultures, we create organizational cultures, and we create uh, project implementation um, methods that, that don't learn themselves to that really critical ongoing learning process. And I think um, most of all, we, we fail to take seriously what we can learn from our local partners about what local conditions are, what will and won't work, um, what their prior priorities are, and so on. I think that Paul you did a really good job of articulating how important it is to have local people in the driver's seat. Um, I just did want to push it a little bit further and say, if they're not there at the very beginning, and if they're not defining the priorities, and if they're not uh, um, if they're not invited to at the outset and continually tell us where our assumptions are, are going counter to what is actually true in their context, then we never will accomplish uh, either aid effectiveness or development success. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to open it up to questions and answers. Um, we have two microphones on either side. Um, I think that there's a, a ton of questions that a set of um, uh, talks such as these would inspire. So who is going to start us off? Yes. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. OK, since I'm right near the mic. Um, my name is Sophia Vanderbilt, I work at MCC, so I'm thrilled to hear that some people really like it. I used to work at Commodics, so I know Betsy Bassett's face. Um, so since you recommended that somebody ask about evaluation lessons, I thought I would. Um, and also congratulations, Social Impact, because I know you have quite a few contracts with us, including one right now trying to develop monitoring and evaluation capacity building plans. So. Um. Yeah, well, I, I was kind of holding it off. Maybe they would invite me back so I could have 10 minutes for everyone, too. <laughs> um, I was just, just jotting down a few of them. That, that, uh, number one, we don't do evaluation very well. We do a lot of it. We don't do it very well. MCC has made probably more of an investment in, in evaluation than any other program, but, but it's also a program, it, it's a program that has a high degree of discipline and focus to it, uh, which uh, if you look at a typical aid program, and, and a mission, it's all over the map, and it's very hard to do uh, the kind of evaluation work that would meet the standard of uh, Ruth Levine. Uh, uh, and, and Ruth, by the way, uh, who is the new evaluation and program policies are at aid, asked uh, a colleague of mine, Cindy Winsack, to pass on a rumor that she thought 
probably a, no more than 10% of USA projects would be subject to randomized controlled trials. So for those of you who are worrying about RCTs, <laughs> she said spread that rumor if you would. So I'm spreading the rumor uh, uh, around. Um, and uh, the American Evaluation Association has taken a very different position on, on rigor, uh, which uh, I would advise that you read. Um, evaluation is done, but even when it's not, quote, rigorous in the impact evaluation sense, it's not done very well. And the reasons for that are historical, and they have to do with they don't give you enough time, they don't give you enough budget, and they don't do their own homework at the front end anyway. Uh, so a baseline study that was done two and a half years into a five-year project is not really a baseline study. Right. Uh, so things like that. Well, what have we learned? Well, one of the things I think we've learned, and it fits with I think the context here, is building trust uh, is a function of longevity and mutual respect and mutual learning. And I'm going to cite uh, an AID program, uh, AED program in uh, Croatia, uh, which uh, went on for seven and a half years, and which I evaluated along with a colleague. Uh, in civil society, and I think it was one of the more successful programs, and I've seen a lot of civil society programs there. Why was it long? Uh, why was it because AID, AED was in the saddle and systematically turned power over to the Croatians? And uh, by the time they were going out, the Croatians had created not only a bunch of good NGOs, but regional resource centers, but a financing mechanism by which the Croatian civil society structure would, would, would remain in place. Not without problems, but those are, they, had, they left institutions in place that would allow civil society to change and grow and adapt to the changing needs of Croatia as it enters into the EU. A second question, learning thing that I've done is getting the problem right. So many of the evaluations I do start with very, with projects that had very weak analysis. And this goes to, to the point that I think several people have made, and that is we don't learn enough from the local people to, 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 to define the development constraints and the development opportunities in ways that reflect the reality of the local environment. And if we don't do that, then we tend to have hammers looking for nails rather than building a development intervention that is consistent with the real constraints and the real opportunities and talents. And, and, and capabilities that are on the ground. I started my life as an academic and I spent the first year of my research life uh, living with Indian farmers uh, who were adapting the HYV seeds in the Punjab and, and in uh, Rajasthan. I learned more from that year than frankly any other year I've ever spent in my life because I was out there with these folks and facing the kind of problems that they faced. Third, uh, sequencing. We tend to put aid up front and then look around for people who will buy into our project. Rather than, as I was able to do with the Asia Foundation, small amounts of money, react to people who came to me and said, we have done this, this, and this, and now we need a little help. And I could give them a little help, and then they come back and say, "Wow, well, we could do this, this, and this, and I'd give them a little more help. The system in which we operate is a five-year project system there's an RFP on the street right now for Cambodia, $75 million over five years for food security. Many, some of you may have seen it. Um, and we're going to be doing $75 million worth of food security work, damn it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and you see where I'm getting at is that we, we, it's hard for us to empower people when we are putting together a five year plan. And as I spoke to my colleagues out in the mission in Cambodia, and I said, and I was talking about Paris Declaration, they said, well, one of the principles of Paris Declaration is to begin to do what you're saying, move more into the government, move more uh, accountability, and, and use the government procurement systems and this kind of thing. I said, as long as I'm accountable for the money, I have to keep control of the money, uh, and we're not going to move money into uh, the government of Cambodia, period. Well, and you start looking at the ADS, and you look at the must and the mandatories in the ADS, the automated directives, uh, I can understand where they're coming from. I can understand that. So sequencing, and, and this is the, 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 the back and forth between development progress and the reward of development progress by saying, now we can do some more. We don't have a system that allows us to do that. And lastly, building, you know, I've, I've become very skeptical of policies and laws and even institutions uh, because 
I've seen too many institutions that survive because they keep getting donor money, but which are no longer functional in one way or another with respect to what's really going on in their own country. We can build capacity. I see NGOs that look like Care International, uh, but so what? You know, they're still getting all of their money from Care International or from the DFID or from somebody else. So how do we then use our resources to incentivize ownership, which means taking responsibility, which means being funded from within somehow. Uh, and, and right now, we, we can't do that. We, we, we write a proposal, we send out a competitive uh, grants uh, solicitation, uh, and of course, every NGO in the country says, oh God, here's another competitive <coughs> grant. What do they want? Oh, well, they want uh, uh, child abuse. Okay, can we do that? Sure, we can do that. You know, and so you can see what's happening here in this, in this dynamic. And so this is the stuff that's on the ground every day. If you want to understand what the constraints of doing business the way that you guys are talking about, just start reading the request for proposals and reading what the missions are saying and putting out on the street uh, in terms of what. We have missions that are outsourcing their whole m and &E shop. Going to you, they won't even own the, the information that is being generated by m and &E. Uh, you know, we have missions that are outsourcing big chunks of their program offices. When I was an aide, you know, the program office was really the, you know, the, the front line of intellectual thinking, the people who thought about development and got into fights with the technical people, and it was great. You know, it doesn't happen anymore. Anyway, I'll stop with that. Thank Sorry, you that gave me a chance. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Good question. Okay, other questions? Brave souls out there. Tony. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One is, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, just a couple of sure. points. One is um, for Sid, actually. One real, going back to your points, I mean, this is really an important conversation. This is one of the most interesting conversations I've heard about development in this town for a while. And the problem, of course, always is, okay, this is over. In a half hour, we're over, we walk away. So the question for Sid is, how do you continue this? And how do you continue this outside of Washington and have this discussion be more real? Because I, I think it would be really exciting to do that. Uh, I think this idea of trying to keep the eye on the prize of change rather than the project objectives is really important. But that implies having everybody agree with that, including the people who are giving the money. And one of the problems is if the incentive for careers, for le legislatures, for everybody is size of budget. Boy, he must be really important. He has $50 million versus $10 million. Remember Carol Peasley, everyone really w wondered why she gave up money when she was in Malawi. She said, you know, we don't need to do that anymore. They've changed their worldview of, of maize. We're going to give back this policy money. And everyone said, you what? But, you know, how is that going to affect your career? The one part that I think is a big question here is you're taking people if you put people into this and their job as a career person in MCC or AID or Oxfam, the problem is you may have a program that lasts 20 years, but the person cycles through much faster than that. And so how you pass on knowledge and what was the point of the effort and why are we happy about Cambodia today when in fact I, I'm the third person in Cambodia from when the time the program started, I think is actually also a very serious problem. Because I, I know of no donor that does a good job on handover notes. I know frankly very few partners who do a very good job of that. Comments, yeah. Um, I, I think you raise a key point and uh, if I look back at the Pakistan example and others that have worked, uh, there was an extremely strong USAID staff who had tremendous depth in engineering, in economics, in development, in policy, and it is that group that was energized and engaged and actually led the dialogue with government. Now, if we look at what has happened to USAID over the last 25 years, it's not surprising that we have lost our ability to have government-to-government -government dialogue because, in fact, we can't have the same kind of dialogue with a foreign government as our government can. So that's an essential missing component. And uh, uh, so to, to get from here to there, and just one other comment, uh, I think, based on what Richard was saying. Uh, 
what is the old so, you know, uh, an hypothesis that is not capable of being proven false. It's not a valid hypothesis. And so we used to have teams, and we still do, that design projects and they go out and look whether those projects meet criteria, economic, social, technical, et cetera, et cetera. And I've done informal research. Basically, that means I've asked a few friends. Um, <laughs> Um, you speak of taxi driver, right? Right, I have a taxi driver. Some of my best friends are taxi drivers. I'm from Pakistan. Um, <laughs> me and I lived in Nigeria. Um, but basically, you, you look at 100 projects that were designed, and I don't know very many that, where the design came back and said, you know, this is a piece of crap. It's not going to work. You send out the design team, so what we are in is supply push rather than demand pull. And so I think Richard's point about that is, is very important. Stacey. Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up on the, the, the issues that Richard and Tony raised about uh, the capacity of USAID. And I think, again, this makes me want to say, what about, what about local knowledge? What about FSNs? When we say, well, you know, by the 10th or 15th year of the project, seven people have cycled through. We're talking about expatriate staff. We're not really talking about the FSNs who are in the missions for a long time, typically, who have that continuity um, and who have the local knowledge that can ground truth our hypotheses. Uh, and, and USAID has, has you know, as, as we're enumerating the number of USAID sins and um, shortcomings, one of them we have to keep in mind is that we've really made poor use of our, of our FSN staff. I was delighted yesterday to see a notice come out about a senior advisory corps among the FSN that's being established in USAID. I think that this will hopefully, if it's implemented fully, go a long way toward making better use of that knowledge resource. But I, I really think that we need to start um, casting our net broadly. So we say, okay, if the m and &E capacity is outsourced, what difference does that make? It may make a difference, it may not. Um, I, I would want to ask, what are the functions that need to be fulfilled, and are they are they being fulfilled by somebody? That that seems to me a prior question as to, you know, whether they're being fulfilled within USAID or outside. But also, are we making best use of all of the knowledge available to us, and that that has to begin with with FSNs and then lead outward from there. I think that Asif's point about govern, government to government discussions is, is probably an exception to that. I think that local staff are not in a position to have the kinds of discussions with governments that expatriate staff are. They're just too vulnerable. But I think uh, a lot of development is not government to government and uh, there is a lot of continuity there if we grant to local staff uh, the knowledge and the central role that they ought to have the knowledge that they do have in the central role that they ought to have. Paul. I just want to tie this uh, back to the earlier question um, on evaluation <coughs> and to Stacy's comment back to me, because I think it's a really important debate. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm, Stacy, I'm with you on, um, to maybe to be a little shorthand about it, if, if, if it's the easterly worldview, which is, you, we don't know everything you need to know when you go into a context, you need to learn where they're coming from and, and, and then start your development on that basis for the Sachs worldview, which is more like we can come up with the perfect village and if it's done right with enough resources, we can, we can solve this problem. I'm, I'm, I'm more of an easterly person. But here's the debate for the MCC and for you on this knowledge management stuff. If the development discussion in the United States right now is no longer ambiguous about what success is, and it's moving in the direction that Asif is talking about, if people are, and I believe they are, talking about Haiti, not as a bunch of discrete pro projects and programs where we can go in and learn how to do water and how to do healthcare and make sure that these are locally adjusted, but the bigger success story in Haiti right now is we have to fix Haiti. There are people in the US government who are saying that's success. And everything we do has to think about having Haiti work as a country, and that's the measure. We don't, at some level, yes, we have to apply the principles you're talking about in terms of knowledge, in terms of how we do it, but not in terms of working out what success is like. Meaning, we know we need a functioning, accountable, moderately benign, um, 
government in Haiti over the next period of years that can manage its own affairs. Done deal. Everything that we evaluate from this point on is going to be held against that measure of success. And then you get into a discussion about what knowledge is most effective. Rather than what for many of us were weaned on in the NGO game when we started out, you go into a community, you don't even know what you want until you ask them first. And that's, that's where I think the tension potentially is. Can I ask you a question? Do you think that the people of Haiti disagree with you about the, the need for a stable and functional government? And if not, why factor them out of that priority setting? I don't, I don't think they disagree. In fact, I don't, but I think the point is, is that 10, 15 years ago, if we had had the, debate, the, the Haiti discussion, Oxfam is now trying to provide water to 500,000 people in, in Haiti. We'll have that by June or July. We're providing to about 150,000. 15 years ago, if we had had the Haiti discussion in the United States, it would have been nothing more than Oxfam and a bunch of both non-profit and for-profit trying to accumulate that and at a disaggregated level talk to Haitians about how to do water, how to do it, and so on and so forth. But I get the sense that what the Obama administration is challenging us with is a new idea about what the goal is when we bring our development dollars to bear. And note, the Haitians don't agree that they want America to engage in a long-term and sustainable way as a partner for success. When we brought the ambassador of Haiti here to talk about what they wanted, he said, we gave you the Louisiana Purchase, so you need to give us a chance for the future over the next 30 years. That has to be the development project now. Don't be talking about 18 months. But the reason I think, so I, I, what I'm worried about is the distraction of the knowledge debate. Sorry to go on, but just here's the point for me. They're setting up this commission now in Haiti, which President Clinton is probably going to have a key role in, where they are expected to deliver development success to the international community, primarily the United States, within 18 months. That's the challenge. And if we sit around thinking about, hold on a second, we should start, <coughs> one, we need to just recalibrate the timeline and what's expected. And yes, of course we need Haitians in the driver's seat, but there's a different knowledge debate when you are asking the question, okay, we want Haiti in the right timeline to get there, how do we make sure Haitians are in the lead on the one hand? And if we go into Haiti with the old uh, approach, I'm not saying you're proposing this, but there is a danger that people will hear it and say, we can't even start to work in Haiti until we first think about where the discussion is there. There's, what I'm saying is there's a common set of assumptions about what success looks like, but we just have to make sure it's driven as a development story, not as a diplomatic or defense story. That's where I think the tension is. I think I mean, that if you, if you push that, and everybody in the development set has been pushing that distinction, uh, that you're in a losing game, at least with this administration, uh, I think we may as well face up to that, but frankly. Uh, I, I think that uh, you're, the other approach to that is to see whether or not one could do more to have a small policy group in the Department of State that was not only willing to understand that this will take a long time, but that would be powerful enough to advocate for a different set, uh, set of uh, time dimensions, and thirdly, would be willing to take on the Department of Defense uh, as part of the equation, rather than uh, as when I was asked to do the Paris Declaration and said, oh, by the way, you're not going to go to the Department of Defense. Uh, well, you know how important, as you described, in the back of the seats or in the front of the seat, the Department of Defense is for five of the, uh, if not nine, of the top eight recipients today uh, in, in, in our foreign assistance program. So, I, I mean, yeah, it would be great. I'd love to see this, but I think I'm going to go to Tony's point in that if we start, don't start looking at the real world incentive structure, not only on our side and the constraints under which these people who are delivering our foreign assistance operate, but also on the government side. Look at their incentive structure. I used the case study of Cambodia. Political leadership in Cambodia has a sweet deal. They don't have any real incentive to improve the quality of government's governance in Cambodia. There's a few areas where they do cooperate, health, like they brought down the HIV prevalence rate. Uh, they've been active in anti-trafficking and some of those issues, and you've got to give them credit for that. But those are credits that also get vastly rewarded by the Global Fund, by uh, whole big pots of money uh, around the world. And they're cheap for them. They don't threaten any rice bowls. 
Whereas if you start talking about rule of law, if you start talking about effective justice systems, if you talk about land titling, which the World Bank tried to do and got stopped, uh, then you're talking about a very different game. And so if you don't understand their incentives and their lack that of incentives for good governance, uh, then you're not going to get anywhere. You know? So I think you really have to start understand, and this is what local knowledge is about, understanding why people do what they do today. And that includes aid, that includes the FSNs, and that includes the government. And we don't do enough of that. And so we ended up, as I said, you know, we got a lot of hammers looking for nails. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Allison Johnson, and I just wanted to push further on the issue of local empowerment, local capacity building, and really challenge the points again that Paul uh, was trying to make around the shift that the United States government would have to make to take on the recommendations he was making. I would like to see if Paul and Asif could step us back and look at the ramifications of colonialism and imperialism in the legacy of our international development work. I have been really struck by that recently as our whole of government begins to really reassess what is the role the United States of America wants to play around the world. And I ask that question because I look at some of the examples the panel has used. If Asif could speak to Pakistan, because I look at the power of the Pakistani government to take direction in terms of where it wants to go. The United States may not agree all the time with the way Pakistan has evolved, but it's been convicted in terms of how it wants to develop. Versus the case of Cambodia, where it has been stumbled on and stumbled over because of colonial legacies that came from Europe and then got translated through the United States of America and have affected the Cambodians' ability to drive their future. And you can argue back and forth while, about the role of democracy or not in that process. And, and I think it's also important in this issue with Haiti, if Paul could point to that, because one of the things the ambassador, uh, Raymond Joseph, likes to speak about is that whole issue of racism and racial discrimination against Haiti since it was born, and the whole issue of how do you empower a country and its people if underneath it there's still colonialism and imperialism and all these implications that well, we can't transfer the power to certain people around the world because there isn't the belief that they can govern themselves, that they can organize themselves, that they can have the power to run their economies, their polities, their societies. That's implied so much in our international development dialogue. And I think it's important to ask that if we're going to look at how to have development success. If you're going to empower local people, you have to believe that they have the power to do it. Why did it work in Croatia? Why? Is it because people believed in Croatians the ability to do it? So that, that's my, my question for the panel. Thank you. Thank you. The colonialist uh, colonization and imperialism issue. Uh, India was colonized and is subject to all of the same forces. So there are certain differences, and those differences are country specific and not at this stage necessarily <coughs> driven by those factors. And those factors are historically true, but every country has some set of factors that's historically true. What happened in Pakistan is that. Uh, an initial uh, assumption uh, was broken. And that assumption was that civil society had some rights and that government had some accountability to the people. And what Pakistan has proven over decades is that you can have elected dictatorship or you can have military dictatorship. When people are elected, they jail their opponents. If they're in the military, they don't have to you know, take the step of getting elected, they still jail there. But what's been lost is the question that government is accountable to the population. And so I want to address the, this issue of handing over power, because that can be easily misunderstood. Uh, when I say we need to strengthen governments, 
I do not mean that we need to start giving all the money to corrupt governments around the world to start managing now. Because what's going to happen is that money is not going to serve its purpose. And in fact, we will weaken rather than strengthen those countries. But I don't think we should ignore the fact that there has been huge movement around the world in some of the least likely places, in Senegal, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Benin, in Libya, and the list goes on in Tanzania, of governments actually becoming, and many of these are MCC countries, uh, thank you, um, uh, these countries want, they have very powerful incentives because you have elites that are connected to the rest of the world that don't want to be left out. And as they improve and as they demonstrate the capacity and as we help them build the capacity, we transfer more. But just dumping it all uh, and without oversight uh, would, would be a terrible mistake. So, you know, uh, the timeline issue is very important. But we have to start spending more attention on uh, building capacity of, of governments. Oh. Um, thanks for the question, Juan. I, um, I think at some level we need to break it out into two different discussions. There is a lot of the, the reason we're in this room is that people who have been on the wrong end of power and economic equations end up living in poverty. We want to find useful ways to be helpful to them. A lot of the best work that we will do is just because it's the right thing to do with populations, with communities, with individuals who no one else has been paying attention to, and we apply all the principles that Stacy's talking about and many of us just know viscerally about listening, being humble, and working with them off their priorities. And that is, it, at some level, it is an attempt to fight back what's happened as a consequence of colonialism. Because for the most part, those populations got marginalized both during the colonialist period and, and continue to be. So we want to be in those countries that people don't care about politically. There's this other discussion that we have to get our heads around as development professionals too, which is that there are, there's new money and new opportunities and new attention to the idea that development can actually further US foreign policy if it's done right and can fight, can help to assuage some of the concerns around colonialism. And that makes things very uncomfortable for many of us who got into this business because we were concerned around the kinds of abuses that, that exist in the sort of colonialist model because it involves sentences like the United States has a national interest in other countries being stable, growing economically, and managing their own security. And if we as development professionals say, hold on a second, we'd like to jump into that discussion. We'd like it not just to be a diplomatic and defense discussion, but if you really want those countries to work, then we have a model for you. And it involves some economic ideas, and political ideas, and security ideas, and it's very long term, but it's only going to work. You're only going to get your national security outcome if you allow us to treat this as a development problem. And then we find ourselves in something that sounds very like a colonial debate. We need all the countries in the world under the new national security paradigm to be moderately stable and moderately tolerant. And, and we want to be part of that discussion. And the, the secret to our success is not being co-opted in the ways that the questions are being talked about. So that we're there, we're pushing for development principles, but we don't become part of the problem. And that's going to be hard. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think that we have time, really, it has to be a very quick question, very quick responses. And then we're going to have the exciting moment of executive summaries. So just one quick question. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. Dee Loftus from uh, Department of State. I'm a Franklin Fellow. My question is I'm interested in evaluation and in how to build the success from the relief aspects initially into the development, ongoing success of development. And what I'm seeing in research is that there's really this issue of corruption, which Asif has spoken and many of you have discussed. And I'm wondering about lessons learned for how do you push through the corruption issues successfully and I'm also, the stability issues, like the, the, the role of DOD and how to help make, what's been successful, how do we learn, how do we look at integrating those uh, pieces, factors forward? Great. Uh, if it's going to be quick, one quick comment from me is we are going to have to redefine our tolerance for corruption. Um, 
It, there is no such thing as zero risk development. If you want to do zero risk, risk development, go develop Finland. We are working in places, where, yeah, maybe not Finland, <laughs> maybe nowhere. <laughs> but I'm really glad you're asking the question too, um, because I think it, until we grapple with the, the corruption issue, Congress is not going to buy the argument that ultimately long-term development solutions have to be in the hands of recipient governments. So we're going to have to increase some level of tolerance for risk and be a lot smarter about how we manage it. Can we just also say, I don't think that we need to assume that, that Haitians don't know where to begin. I think that they feel the urgency every bit as much and that, that they do know where to begin. So I guess I would just bring it back around to this question of um, maybe asking all of us just to undertake an intellectual exercise of saying, what do we stand to lose if they're in the driver's seat? Okay, we, we seem to take for granted we should be in the driver's seat because it, maybe it's more efficient or we know what we're doing or whatever. Just ask ourselves, what, what do we stand to lose? What do they stand to lose if they're in the driver's seat? And then see if that kind of approach makes sense in the priority setting as well as the implementation. Great, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to pretend, we're gonna ask our panelists and our um, discussants to pretend for a moment uh, and see themselves in a YouTube scenario and give us their kind of apex comments that they made today, how they would summarize them. And we'll give uh, our panelists each a minute and a half. Asif, um, can you lead that off? Didn't have to think about it. <laughs> um, summary: um, the big gap is the development gap, and that's the only gap that matters. Aid is simply a means of getting there, and therefore the profession of aid has to fit itself to the needs of achieving development at scale. Uh, we talk about 3Ds, uh, it really isn't about defense, it's about security. If I think from a development perspective, it's about security. It's na our national security, yes, but it's security within countries. It's not a military issue because take the example of Madagascar, first MCC country, two weeks. In the New York Times words, it went from, Tana went from a city of a thousand boutiques to a thousand garbage cans overturned in the street. So we don't know how to maintain stable countries. We don't know how to maintain a compact between governments and citizenry. And unless, uh, at scale, and unless we pick up on the examples, uh, I, I shouldn't say we don't know how, we haven't focused enough attention on that. And unless we pay more attention to where that is working and to learn how it is working, we are simply not doing what we all set out to do, which is to help make development happen, not to be simply aid practitioners. Thank you very much. Paul, your turn. Okay, so if it is about development effectiveness and we look at places like South Korea and ask why they were languishing at the same economic level as Sudan 40 years ago, but have radically changed the possibilities for their own people as a consequence of a development journey they've been on. And if it is in the end of the day, non-negotiable that governments have to be effective and the citizens have to be engaged in the development project and the relationship between them is the only thing that matters or at least is the most important thing that matters on the development journey, then we don't have to ask ourselves, what does success look like in any context? We know that's success, and we have to align what we do either to help states be stronger in responding to their citizens, or help citizens realize their own aspirations, both by the work they do themselves and how they hold their governments accountable. That's a non-negotiable. It's as important in Haiti as it is in Afghanistan, as it is in all those countries we are not talking about now, but if we don't think in those terms, we may be talking about for the wrong reasons down the line. Then the question is, how do we effectively help states work? And how do we effectively put citizens in the lead? And that, from this discussion, 
is clearly all about not thinking we have the answers. And that means we're going to have to take some huge risks. We are going to have to take precious US taxpayer dollars and we're going to have to put them in the hands of governments and people that have not proven they can do it, but need to learn by doing. If we want them to lead, we need to let them lead. And that means an education process here around what success is ultimately about. Until we have a national strategy for global development in the United States that says this is what development success is going to look like everywhere, it's going to be very hard for the development professionals in the MCC or USAID or the State Department to wake up and say, I know what the end goal is and I know how I'm working with all my my colleagues in other agencies to do it. So I think we're going to get that strategy out of this administration. I certainly hope we are. But once we have it, then our task is to work towards those goals with some level of humility around what we bring in terms of knowledge to the discussion, but with absolute clarity around where we're trying to get to in the end of the day. Evaluation done well uh, contributes to answering the hows and the whys. Uh, we don't do it very well, and when we do do it well, there aren't a lot of people listening. Um, that's number one. Um, number two, uh, if we don't focus our attention on what people are facing as they come to work and look at their inbox in the morning and look at their ADSs and look at uh, how they spend their time, we're never going to be able to create the kind of core that you're calling for that is actually doing development rather than managing contracts because uh, that's what most eight people do today. Uh, and thirdly, uh, that uh, I think that we also have to understand that we are democracy and we have a Congress. And I first met George Ingram when, when we were trying to rewrite the Foreign Assistance Act. And we didn't get very far because all of those folks with special interest in our Congress said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean, no earmarks? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? Uh, and uh, that's a reality. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, if you're projecting the kind of vision that you are projecting, then we also have to have a strategy for tr totally transforming the way uh, the government has created a system that affects the way we do business today. And I can tell you, I don't think it's really very much aligned with the kind of risk-taking, sequencing, uh, development process that you've been describing. So we've got to start at home, not just with a strategy, but with a different way of doing business if you're going to go that way. Thank you very much. Stacy. We've talked a lot today about uh, what we do know about um, successful development and what we don't know about successful development. In order to achieve the kind of scale that we need to achieve, in order to address the challenges that we face in, in the developing world, we need to do a much better job at capturing what we do know and sharing that in ways that uh, spin out those effects and enable um, adaptation and scale up much more broadly than our actual development dollars can stretch. So, so that's the first point. Scale really depends on using the knowledge that we do have um, much more effectively and, um, and spreading it as widely as possible. The second point is this question of what we don't know and the role of of local knowledge in filling in those knowledge gaps. Um, and, and this really touches on uh, both the issue of priority setting and the issue of implementation. In order to achieve not just project success, but development success and, 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 aid of, and uh, development effectiveness, we need to use all of our knowledge resources and talent much more constructively, and that has to begin with making much better use of local knowledge and having local people in the driver's seat in terms of defining development priorities and uh, helping us test our hypotheses about how we achieve our development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Asif Sheikh, uh, president of IRG, a leading development consulting firm to Paul O'Brien, Vice President at Oxfam, a leading nonprofit NGO voice, to uh, Richard Blue and Stacy Young, both of them uh, leading experts in evaluation and knowledge management. We really appreciate your having taken the time today to come and share your thoughts on this most important subject. Uh, we want to thank all of you for coming today. We want to, you, you to remember as you go out that if the person next to you did not raise their hand and is not a member of SID, 
you will have a little discussion with them and tell them why you are and lead them to the form in the back. I know I'm relentless. Thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you to our